Now that Mr. Ginhaus here at 3.31, at least according to that uh, clock, we can start the class, okay? I am sure the door will open uh, and somebody else will stop momentarily. So, uh, some announcements. You are late, very late, for my standards. So, uh, let's see what the announcements will be. Um, there is a homework due, right, that's of this. Uh, on Friday, I will give a regular lecture, okay, this Friday, and uh, so I'll send you a reminder. And uh, keep in mind, I have no plans to give one extra lecture this semester, which means we're going to be missing a number of lectures, uh, for sure, a sequence of them in November. Uh, which is good because that will allow you a lot of time to work or pretend that you're working on your project. All right, that's one announcement. Uh, what was the other announcement? I forgot. Oh, I know the other announcement is very important. I intend to go to the civil engineering picnic uh, this uh, uh, afternoon. So anybody who has questions, please come immediately after the lecture to my office. I'm not going to leave it for there, but if you're not there, I may leave, and uh, don't look for me unless you come to the picnic. Okay. Uh, so lecture 10, I was told, uh, has not been posted properly on the internet, so I will correct it as soon as I go back in the office. Okay. Must be a Dropbox uh, uh, link. All right. So, uh, today, basically, we have to do some uh, light stuff to complete uh, uh, topics on regression. And uh, so I'm going to basically remind you a few things we discussed about model selection and uh, computing the marginal likelihood for regression models. I already know there was an example in earlier notes. Um, I am going to do, and you know, maybe not in the order that's on the cover there, I'm going to do a problem where um, uh, the model selection is going to become uh, a variable selection problem in regression. So in other ways, we're going to throw, let's say, uh, 10 input variables, and we're going to let the data decide how many of them are really important for the type of thing we try to predict. Right? So it will be a variable selection. And it will be sort of a little bit ahead of uh, what we do in this class because I'm going to use some sampling methods to do the variable selection. Nothing major. I will explain what it is. Uh, and you will learn way more than me because you're going to have to implement it on homework three. And don't look so miserable, okay? It's going to be a good exercise on homework three. 
that will be posted tonight. Okay? Um, and then, uh, in preparation for a lecture to come, I'm going to discuss a little bit uh, on how these basis functions uh, models for regression, they have an equivalent form that is defined in terms of kernels. So in many ways, this could be a way to completely get rid of uh, parametric models with basis functions and discuss things only in terms of kernels. And this will eventually lead to ideas of uh, uh, non-parametric models, things like Gaussian processes and the like. Okay. I'm optimistic that we will do all of these things, right? But uh, our time is, as we know, it's uh, not infinite. But uh, uh, we are all going to be around for um, next semester and after that. So there will be all the classes. OK. Uh, so uh, let me start with uh, a little bit of review. And then I'm going to tune this uh, in the context of uh, regression. So. Uh, let's assume that we have many different models, and in this case, since we talk about regression, this can be, uh, so when I say different models in the context of regression, you can think you use different basis functions. In one, you use maybe sigmoids, in another one, you use um, uh, Gaussians, in another one, you use maybe polynomials, uh, or it can also imply fixed basis functions, but you don't know how many of them you need to use in your problem, okay? So the different models can differ in the uh, number of basis functions uh, that you use. So uh, the idea would be to produce a posterior over models. And this is written as prior times this marginal likelihood that uh, we already have seen extensively uh, as important. This is sort of the normalizing factor in uh, the Bayes rule uh, that is not important for inference but it's very important, uh, important for uh, model comparison. So in uh, the homework, is the homework today has the biggest factor or it was the first one? The, the, this one? All right. So um, uh, and actually in, on homework three, you will also have to compute Bayes factors uh, as well, which is effectively nothing else but the ratio of the uh, two uh, marginal likelihood. So basically, you try to find which model best explains the data that you have observed. OK. Um, now, an equation that I have not uh, uh, put up in the slides earlier, right? If you have all of these models and you want to do prediction for a new uh, test point x, so let's say you train your model with some data d, and now you want to find what uh, your response is at the new test data point x. In essence, if you have already trained multiple models, the predictions and you can see this an application of the of the summer rule effectively and summer product rules. Effectively, the prediction will be a mixture of predictive distributions, each of them defined for uh, every model. All right, look carefully. Right, I haven't really done anything. I there is no MI here, so this is a prediction independent of what model you use. And then I write this as a model averaging of these predictions for each model times the posterior of each model. So this is some sort of a, an easy equation that somehow you can implement in your research tomorrow. And yes, this is not a difficult thing to compute, right? This is what Bayesian inference is all about. But obviously, having to compute the posteriors over models is very complicated. It will take a lot of computational time. And uh, if this involves uh, engineering or scientific codes, this type of mixture uh, would be very expensive to implement. Now, Bayesian um, inference predictions and decision making, right, is all about averaging, averaging the parameter space, averaging in, in the model space, etc. But if you talk to statisticians, they will tell you, you should not do this, because if you do this, it's like saying to yourself that you don't believe that any of the model is the right model, that all the models are garbage. So maybe if you average garbage, you will get something reasonable. So, the, so don't get uh, misled by the fact that this looks a nice equation. It may be better to find a model uh, that uh, best justifies the data and use that model to do predictions. OK, so. Um, uh, this is uh, the marginal likelihood that I'm going to uh, use today in the context of regression. So let's say this 
W's are the regression coefficients for model MI. So effectively, to calculate this marginal likelihood, you have to put W back, right? Because the likelihood requires that you know what W is. And uh, then, of course, uh, you know, uh, so in this case, is, uh, there's no, so this is the prior, basically, of WI under model MI. And then you average, right? This is the normalization factor, basically, in, uh, in, uh, in Bayes' rule that you see in the equation on the bottom. All right, and, and actually, uh, and this is completely my fault, right? You may see on this slide uh, a very sort of um, um, equation busy calculation of this marginal likelihood, simply because when uh, many, many years ago, when I was started you know, teaching some of these things and, and I was computing this marginal likelihood, Somehow, I, I used to like to suffer having to do lots of hand calculations. But right now, we already have discussed that if you want to compute this, is effectively um, uh, a ratio of normalization factors of the likelihood, the prior, and the posterior. So if you see the slides with a lot of busy work, you really you shouldn't do that anymore, because we already know that if you have the normalizing factors for the three uh, terms that you see here, then you can compute directly the marginal likelihood. I'm saying this because in, I know in this set of nodes, it does all the dirty work from scratch, basically. Okay. So, um, we discuss about model complexity, and, and here we are, you know, just to make sense, we're discussing this in the context of regression. So, this is uh, all possible data sets that you can collect, and they are ordered in complexity. There is, you know, you don't need to sort of to say what does it precisely this, but you can imagine, you know, these are simple data that maybe fit on a straight line, these are data that fit uh, on, you know, they have higher variability and this is oscillatory data. Okay, so you put the data in some order of uh, complexity and this is the marginal likelihood and we already have discussed that effectively there is a difference when it comes to simple models because simple models only explain a few data. Intermediate uh, models, they explain, explain uh, a wide range of data. And very complex models, they explain lots of data, but each of them with low probability. Okay? Uh, and uh, the reasoning basically behind this graph is that when you integrate this for all possible data sets, uh, then these distributions have to be normalized. Right? So, in some sense, when you have a very complex model, it assigns a low probability to all data sets. So, certainly, it's not the right model to, collect, to select. And the right model for a given uh, data, uh, D0, is a model of intermediate complexity. So, what you will need to do in, um, not just in regression, but in every problem, when you have to select the complexity of your problem, you have to compute this, uh, you know, marginal likelihood. Okay, and then somehow you're going to have to find through some optimization problems, and you already sort of you did this with the Bayesian information criterion. You have to find uh, some intermediate complexity model uh, to select. Okay, uh, so let me uh, th this I should have put this uh, slide uh, um, in the very very early lectures because it's sort of uh, a slide. Uh, that needs to come before the Laplace approximation for the posterior. But on the other hand is, you know, I miss it, but, you know, we can see it once more in, uh, in, uh, in a very simple context. So what I have here is, you know, we have a model, and I omit the particulars of the model, so MI is not shown explicitly. I have the marginal likelihood written as the likelihood uh, times the prior divided by the posterior. And I am assuming, you know, for a scalar uh, situation, that basically the uh, prior looks like that. It's a flat prior. And you remember, we always approximate the, the uh, posterior with a delta function. So let's, you know, we're not going to do a plus approximation here, which is the right way to go. But let's assume that the uh, map has, the, um, the posterior is, uh, uh, picked around W map, all right, 
and they look like that, okay? So can I remember these distributions, the prior and the posterior, have to be normalized. So if this is uniform, uh, what is the height of the prior? I mean, I have defined here some lengths, right? I call this delta W prior, which is the extent of the prior distribution. This is the range of the, uh, of the posterior. So what is this uh, height of this blue line? It's 1 over delta W prior. So what you get from here is you get uh, delta W posterior divided by delta W prior. So if you take uh, the logs of this, you get uh, the log of the, the likelihood times the log of uh, uh, the, the extent of the posterior divided by the extent of the prior. And you agree that this is a number that is less than 1. Right? So a log of something less than 1 is negative. So effectively, you can immediately appreciate that when you try to maximize uh, uh, this marginal likelihood, effectively, it is a competition between maximizing the likelihood that effectively you can keep doing it with more and more and more complex models. But then there is this term that penalizes you, right? And it is the balance of complexity and fitting the likelihood that uh, will tell you what is the best model. So this is for one parameter. You can actually assume of something like that with m parameters. And this looks very similar to what we did with uh, the Laplace approximation, which is obviously um, a much better approximation to what you see here. But this is a good way that tells you the competition between these likelihood models and uh, these complexity uh, terms that when combined together will tell you what is the right model uh, to explain your data set. Okay, um, so let's uh, uh, go back to the real regression problem uh, and uh, try to see how, okay, so um, I don't have all the slides to review the, uh, the, the model, but if you remember, uh, we have a likelihood that looks like this Gaussian uh, with some uh, precision beta. This is like our first early model, right? Uh, so we have some uh, regression function, which is basically W transpose times our basis functions, some precision beta, so it's a Gaussian that looks like that. And then we uh, put a Gaussian prior, right? And the Gaussian prior uh, had mean zero and uh, what was the precision? What's the notation we used for the prior? I mean, it's not shown in the equation. So when we did the prior, what did we use for the uh, for the precision of the prior? It was a spherical prior. What was the symbol? Alpha or A? You remember when we did, you know, the map estimate and the prediction and everything, you know, uh, the prior on W was a Gaussian center around zero with uh, uh, a precision basically that was given by by this alpha there. Okay? You have to believe me. That's what we did. Okay? Uh, all right. So in this uh, simple regression problem, to be able to do predictions, obviously, we have to assume that the noise beta and this parameter alpha in the, um, in the prior are known, all right? And the nice thing with Bayesian analysis, you don't have to assume that anything is known. So you don't really have to start guessing what numbers to use and say, wow, and if they are wrong, you know, what's the point of having a complex model uh, when I start assuming all these parameters? Well, you don't have to. So we, what we need today we need to discuss what is called the evidence approximation that will allow us to calculate the parameters beta and the parameter alpha that comes in the prior on W. Okay? Uh, now, this fits uh, really literally, there is nothing new to tell you, because this fits exactly on the uh, hierarchical prior models that we discussed uh, a few lectures ago. So, can somebody tell me? You know, we're going to go through this equation, but can you tell me what was this concept on what do we do on hierarchical uh, 
uh, Bayesian models. So we have a prior with some parameters, and then we go on those parameters and put another prior, and then on those we put another prior, and then sometimes we stop thinking, you know, that should be good enough. And what do we do with the hyperparameters? Uh, we can integrate them uh, out, but that requires that we know they're posterior, which, you know, would be something very complicated to get, all right? That would be the best solution, basically, right? But something very complicated to do. By the way, in many regression problems, actually, you can integrate them out if you put the right prior on these hyperparameters. So there are uh, some uh, uh, well-known regression models where you can do it. But in this particular problem, if you go and start uh, trying to integrate alpha um, you know, uh, out, it will be uh, not very easy, OK? So the idea of, um, of these um, hierarchical Bayesian models is the following. Rather than uh, integrate alpha and beta out, which requires that you compute their posterior, how about if you assume that the posteriors of alpha and beta are sharply picked around their map estimate, and you take the map estimate of alpha and beta as the your uh, values for alpha and beta, all right? So effectively, uh, I am going to do a plug-in approximation, all right? So I want to emphasize that terminology because we, you know, we have not used it maybe often enough. So when I am going to do pr predictions, let's say, for a new X to try to predict what uh, my response is going to, to be once I have trained the system with some X and T values, but rather than doing this complicated integral, right, this integral involves the likelihood times uh, the posterior of W times the posterior of alpha and beta. So rather than doing this, you know what I'm going to do? So I'm going to approximate this uh, as a sharply picked distribution around uh, the map estimates of alpha and beta. And then the integral becomes a plug-in approximation, which looks like this. You remember if you integrate with delta function, right? You get the values of the function at those point estimates, all right? So uh, what you see here, all right, uh, this is the marginal, um, the marginal likelihood. And this idea of this methodology that is called the evidence approximation, this is the evidence. And effectively, we will need to compute now uh, this point estimates, this parameters alpha and beta by setting some appropriate optimization problem. Once we do that, then predictions would be based on this formula. All right? So we need to find what are the right, you know, without computing this posterior, how do we find the map estimates of alpha and beta? I mean, when I say without computing the posterior, we're going to assume the posterior is picked around those two values. Uh, so that's the the calculation of the posterior, but what are those two values? Okay, so um, this method in uh, different books over the last 10 years comes with different names. So if you see uh, empirical Bayes, uh, it uh, is the same thing, or uh, type two uh, likelihood, okay, because obviously it must be a type one, uh, or, you know, f for me, evidence approximation is basically the one that. Uh, 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 makes more sense. So how do we compute alpha and beta? Here is the calculation. Uh, we're going to have to, we said we're going to approximate the posterior right with the uh, delta function, but this posterior requires, uh, if we do a complete calculation, it requires a prior on alpha and beta, and then it requires this distribution, uh, P of T given alpha and beta. And what is that distribution? What is P of T? T is this ball T is my data, right? My data, I don't show you the input sex, right? But it's basically the training data. So what is P of T given alpha and beta? It looks like likelihood, right? It's the likelihood. But uh, it does not involve W. Because, you know, when I write this equation, I don't have any Ws on it. There's no W. So we're not just going to call this the likelihood. This is what likelihood? 
the marginal line. All right? So here's the idea. If we assume a flat prior for alpha and beta, so you say, oh, I don't know anything, take uniform distribution. So this becomes unimportant. And finding the uh, map uh, estimates for alpha and beta, rather than maximizing this, becomes equivalent to maximizing the marginal like. And that's exactly what is called the evidence approximation. OK? So the evidence approximation for hyperparameters is the one that ma ma maximizes the marginal likelihood. And the marginal likelihood, how does it is being computed? It's computed through an integration in W. Because the only way we can write the likelihood, right, is if we know the regression uh, problem, right, we have a regression function with some parameters W, uh, and we know our noise beta. So this is the likelihood as we have used it up to now. And this, of course, is the prior. And you notice this calculation, when you integrate W out, it comes that it's only a function of alpha and beta. So what we need to do is, for our simple regression problem, we need to compute this integral. And then when we compute it, we need to find the maximum of that integral with respect to alpha and beta. OK? Uh, this, of course, will vary from one problem to another. What is not going to vary is that you will have to compute a marginal likelihood of this sort of, and that eventually you will have to, of course, take a flat prior, and you will have to maximize this with respect to your hyperparameters. OK? Again, I don't want you to think of this being very specific to our trivial regression problem. This idea is very general. Okay? So regardless of what your machine learning task is, uh, you will have to find hyperparameters rather than trying to integrate them out and computing exactly the posteriors. You do the same approximation and you uh, compute point estimates by maximizing the evidence. So evidence is not this likelihood, right? It's the marginal likelihood. Because, you know, I mean, I, we, you can abuse the language and say my likelihood is an evidence. Yeah, it is. But it involves W. I want to hear the marginal likelihood, and that's what we call evidence. Make sense? All right, so uh, let's do the calculations, because uh, what you get from uh, uh, this simple uh, regression problem, sort of uh, it's applicable to the equations basically come up to have similar forms in, in many other problems in, in uh, machine learning. So uh, I remind you uh, from our likelihood, our likelihood was a Gaussian, right? And on the exponent of that Gaussian, we had a term that basically uh, has the square of the difference between our training data and uh, the regression model, which is the basis function times W. Here's the design matrix. OK? So uh, and similarly, I remind you that the prior, it was a Gaussian with precision alpha centered around 0. So effectively, if you uh, try to multiply, so this is what we need to do. We need to write this likelihood times this prior. And I'm claiming uh, that when you multiply them together, of course, you have an integral in W. This is what you get, where this L of uh, A function is basically a combination of the exponent from the likelihood and the prior. You remember when we were doing the MAP estimate and the MLE estimate? The MLE estimate was minimizing that. The MAP estimate was to include both terms. So I combine them, and this is how this uh, marginal likelihood looks like. This comes from the normalization uh, of the likelihood for a given W. This comes from the prior. And uh, the Gaussians from the likelihood and the prior are combined together to give you this nice form. Yes? Not very complicated, right? It's, uh, and, and again, this is, we have seen it a lot of times. We multiply two Gaussians. So uh, now what you need to do, uh, you need to uh, trust me uh, by completing the square, all right? 
which uh, by the end of this class, uh, if somebody asks you and you say, I don't remember, I never did it actually, uh, it will uh, not sound very good. So by completing the square, so expanding this, you can write this C of W as uh, E computing the, at this uh, uh, map estimate MN plus this non-linear term, W minus MN transpose A times W minus MN, where uh, all the definitions are basically here. So this is uh, the, the mean of the posterior distribution of, for W, right? We computed this two lectures ago. Uh, this is the standard function computed at the posterior mean, so I, instead of W, I put a man. And uh, this um, matrix A is basically a combination of the design matrix and uh, the prior information, all right? So it's alpha times i, and in both you can appreciate basically that this is a regularization term plus beta theta transpose phi. Again, where is this coming? Uh, expand, close the square, immediately you will recognize that this is the case, but there is another way to look at it. I mean, when you look at it visually, is there any other faster way to get it? To get this approximation, what does it remind you? Louder? I don't hear. What approximation? Laplace, nope. Uh, actually, Laplace approximation, Laplace approximation. Yeah, that looks good too. Yeah, because the Laplace approximation is a Taylor series expansion, right? And so effectively, this is the Laplace approximation. The only difference is they say uh, it's constant here, all right? And the first term, the linear term W is missing because if you take the derivative of this function with respect to W at the map estimate is zero by definition. So this thing is where the Laplace approximation. I was going to say it's a Taylor series expansion, but Taylor series expansion is a Laplace approximation. Okay? All right. Uh, so uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to take this and plug it in on the marginal likelihood. So when you do that, you remember if you complete the square for a reason, and what's the reason you complete the square here? Because you get an integral of this exponential and this integral, you know analytically what it is. From where? Normalization of the Gaussian. So that integral comes to be 2 pi to m over 2, so you have m parameters w, times the determinant of a to minus 1 half. That's the reason when you do marginalization, right, that you uh, close the square because this integral exists analytically. You don't have to uh, worry what is that integral and what do you do with it. Okay, so this integral, uh, we know it analytically. Of course, you remember we had uh, E computed at the posterior mean, so this is outside. And um, this is our marginal likelihood, all the terms together. And if you take the log of that, this is a wonderful expression that Im immediately reminds you uh, similar equations, maybe with uh, the Bayesian information criterion and uh, other models that try to maximize the likelihood while penalizing complex models. This is what it is, all right? Um, and so there are some terms that involve data sets. They're not important, but I see it. there's an M term there, uh, and, and of course, there's another M inside this log of the determinant of A, all right? So, uh, and, and of course, the likelihood term comes here. So effectively, we have to compute alpha and beta by maximizing this function. Now, if you get a problem, you get a function like that and you have to maximize, you need to be very, very happy that your problem looks as simple as this. And I'm referring to any typical machine learning task because usually these equations look way much more complex, but this looks very simple, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to try to see how we can uh, take derivatives with respect to alpha and beta and see what are those point estimates. And once we have those, we can use the plug-in approximation, do predictions uh, for each new x to find what the corresponding t is. All right. Um, just to get you a sense, 
on um, how this, so if you take this function, right, and you plot it for a given parameters alpha and beta, this is really not what you want to do, but if you plot it uh, versus the order of the polynomial expansion you, you use, you notice that indeed has a maximum. All right? So obviously, there is uh, an optimal complexity model, all right? There is some optimal complexity for our models that maximizes this marginal likelihood. So what we need to do is basically we need to find that optimal, uh, uh, you know, M uh, for our polynomials that we use, the order of uh, the, the number of basis functions we use in our problem, but also here this plot is for given alphas and betas. We don't really want to have givens. We want to compute alpha and beta by maximizing uh, this expression that you see on the bottom. Uh, now, I have shown you on... Um, um, in a non-Bayesian setting, but if you try to plot the training error and the testing error, so if you use one data set to train your model, you get this blue line on the bottom. Uh, if you use another data set to, to test how well the model does, there is a whole range of uh, polynomial complexity M, but effectively these errors look not to change. So, you know, with a non-Bayesian way, you can say I'm going to use a polynomial for the 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It's partially it gives you the same values. And you notice, um, I don't remember if this is actually a polynomial for the 4th or the bias term is accounted and it's really for the 3, but effectively you notice that they are on the bulk uh, the same sort of value. But this doesn't tell you where to stop if you have this marginal likelihood. It tells you exactly what to do take the maximum, and uh, that is where, uh, that's the optimal complexity. So let's go back to alpha and beta. It's going to become a little uh, murky now, but I want to do this analysis because it's very, very generic for lots of problems, okay? So if you need, uh, how about if you don't understand the mathematics, maybe you can understand pictorially, and I'm going to show you a picture of what this type of analysis does, okay? Like, what does having a prior and, and regularizing the problem and, um, you know, what all of these things have to do with model complexity? So let's do some simple analysis. Objective, so we don't forget, we want to maximize this with respect to alpha and beta. Alpha and beta are scalar parameters, all right? This is what we want. So, uh, Fita transpose tree is, uh, uh, you know, a symmetric matrix. Uh, you know, well behaved, I can do an eigenvalue analysis and let's call the eigenvectors ui, the eigenvalues lambda i. So the metric A that we have uh, in our case here uh, is alpha i plus this metric, so obviously the eigenvalues of a uh, is the alpha plus lambda i. Alpha is a positive number, right? Lambda i would be also positive, okay? So this is the uh, the eigenvalues of our metric A. Now, why do I uh, need to play the, uh, with the eigenvalues? Because you know what? I need to compute the determinant of A, and the determinant of A is the product of the eigenvalues of A. You remember this from um, your intro to, uh, apply to mathematics in, uh, you know, I suppose do you do this in your math course? So, if you know the eigenvalues of this, everybody agrees that, uh, you know, if you rotate somehow the matrix A to the, an eigenbasis, the only thing you're left in the transformed A are the eigenvalues and the diagonal, so the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues, right? So it's good to think of eigenvalues because you don't have to worry about off diagonals and all of these things nice, right? Uh, makes life very simple. So let's compute, you know, this is a more complex term, right? So we have the derivatives of A. Let's concentrate derivatives with respect to A being, uh, to alpha being zero. So we have to calculate the derivatives with respect to alpha. So uh, we have to find uh, the determinant is the log of this, uh, the products of the lambda i plus alpha. This is the same as the summation of the logs of lambda i plus alpha. And if you take derivatives with respect to alpha, what you get is 
summation of 1 over lambda i plus alpha times the derivative with respect to alpha, which is 1. So the derivative of this term, it's a simple, wonderful expression, which is 1 over lambda i plus alpha. OK? Um, uh, very simple relation. So let's compute the rest of the derivatives with respect to alpha. So let's see. Uh, this is what we are differentiating with respect to alpha, right? So from here, you're going to get 1 over alpha, right? So m over 2 uh, divided by alpha there, all right? This, we already said, we get this. And uh, do you agree that if I take derivatives of this with respect to alpha, I get that? This is the error computed at mn. So what's the derivative with respect to alpha? Is 1 half mn transpose mn. Right? So basically, uh, if you rearrange this equation, you get alpha times mn transpose mn equal capital M minus uh, alpha uh, times the summation of 1 over lambda i plus alpha. And um, I'm using a simple trick here. M is equal to the summation of i of 1. So really, what I get is, I get this expression here. So it says, this is the optimal value of alpha, is this term gamma that is defined in terms of the eigenvalues and alpha, divided by mn transpose mn. And I remind you, mn is what is the posterior mean. So this equation looks very complicated. Because we want to compute alpha, but gamma depends on alpha. As a matter of fact, mn depends on alpha. Because this metric A uh, that depends on alpha is inside the mn. So this equation needs to be solved iteratively. OK? So uh, I'm wondering, all of those who are thinking about automatic differentiation, I'm referring to a small group now. How will uh, an optimization uh, problem like this will work when actually this, uh, the differentiation cannot be done in a closed form, but you have to do it uh, in a self consistent manner, right? Something for some to think about. It. But right now, here, if you assume alpha and you calculate gamma, so you find the eigenvalues of our matrix A, you calculate the eigenvalues of I, you find gamma, you compute them in. And you iterate like this, so you find a new update alpha, plug in a new gamma, a new mn, a new alpha. This converges in very few iterations. And, um, um, and this is you know, um, how the algorithm will work like. Now, the mathematics are not very important, right? Because I, I want to see how the final results look like. And sort of what is the physical meaning of these expressions, because the physical meaning of this expression is sort of universal. It comes in lots of different machine learning problems. Uh, but before we do this, we have also to discuss the derivatives with respect to beta. OK? So derivatives with respect to beta, obviously, are going to have the same degree of difficulty. Uh, we're going to need the derivatives of this with respect to beta easy. All right? 1 over beta, you get times 10 over 2. Uh, the derivative of this with respect to beta is easy. So we need to find the derivatives of the log of a uh, with respect the log of the determinant of a with respect to beta. Here you need uh, one observation in one common sense sort of uh, conclusion. If you look at the, what lambda i is, lambda i are the eigenvalues of beta phi transpose p. Right? This is my input design matrix. So you can see that if you double beta, the eigenvalues double. This is normalized. So the lambda over the beta is actually lambda over beta. That's only the only thing you need. OK? So if you uh, write this with the expression we had before as the product of this uh, lambda i plus alpha, then when you take the derivative with respect to beta, you are going to have 1 over lambda i plus alpha times the derivative of lambda i with respect to beta, which is lambda i over beta. And this whole summation is gamma. So uh, basically, this derivative gives you that parameter gamma divided over beta. So uh, this is also an iterative problem. You have to do it in a self-consistent uh, 
uh, manner, all right? So to calculate beta, you know, you are going to assume what uh, uh, mn and gamma is, we estimate beta, and keep iterating it. And if you want, you can do it in a closed loop together with this parameter alpha, with the parameter alpha as well, or you can do it independently. All right. So what, uh, when we take the derivative uh, of this with respect to beta, let's see what the result looks like, right? So the algorithm that we have to do iterations is self-consistency. It is 1 over beta comes to be equal to 1 over n minus gamma summation of the error we do with our regression function of the training data. All right? So can you look at this equation at the bottom and tell me if it reminds you anything? It's a modification of something we already have seen. Uh, and I want you to tell me what modification is that. So it basically says here, right, that the, the variance, the noise in our data is 1 over n minus gamma times uh, this uh, sample uh, uh, error that we do at, with our regression function of the training data. Have we seen this equation in some other form or similar to that? So when we did the maximum likelihood estimation for this regression problem, what was the MLE estimate for 1 over beta? It was 1 over n times that summation. This is the regression problem. So right now, it comes up that 1 over beta, no, it's not 1 over n. It's 1 over n minus gamma. And that is not an accident. It's not an accident because gamma comes out to be, and I, I will show you this graphically, to be effectively the number of parameters that you can estimate well with your data sets. So basically, you throw a lot of basis functions, right? Your problem will only be able to estimate only gamma parameters. The rest n minus gamma will not be able to estimate properly and will throw them near zero, uh, and, and that will be enforced by the prior model. But the number of effective parameters here has to be uh, subtracted by n. And uh, someone mentioned the MLE estimate for a Gaussian. Do you remember that when you calculate an MLE estimate for the variance of a Gaussian, how does the MLE estimate look like for the variance of a Gaussian? Uh, well, so what you get is you get 1 over n times, so it's the empirical, uh, the sample variance. And actually what we go and do is we say, if you want to make it unbiased, put 1 over n minus 1. Because you know what, you have used your data already to estimate the sample mean that comes in the sample variance, right? So you need to subtract that. So here, it's exactly the same situation, uh, but the number of effective parameters is, uh, is gamma. So instead of having 1, we have n minus gamma, and gamma is completely determined in an implicit manner from the data. So uh, let me, you know, so, uh, let's look at this picture. And I actually wanted to, to add some extra information on, on uh, this slide, but maybe um, uh, it would be good enough for you, so I don't have to work hard on it. All right, so um, I have no idea. Maybe I broke my, the wrong notes here. Uh, so let's uh, geometrically look what is going on in the problem. These are the initial contours of the likelihood function. And what I have done is I have uh, rotated basically the axis to coincide with my eigenvectors u1 and u2, I do this in, in, uh, in uh, two dimensions, with the uh, eigenvectors of my uh, free transpose p matrix. Okay? So basically, if you rotate that, then the axis in your equal contrast, this could be ellipses, would be 1 over square root of lambda 1 and 1 over square root of lambda 2. 
I mean, you remember the, you know, the, uh, you know, your likelihood is basically a Gaussian, uh, right? And it looks, you know, uh, W minus um, uh, this MLE estimate transpose, and then you have the covariance, and because I have rotated my axis, the covariance is basically diagonal, one over lambda one, one over lambda two, etc. All right. So in 2D, this is what I get. All right. Um, so the axis here, uh, you notice, so lambda one, lambda two are the precision to the different directions, and obviously lambda one in the axis u one is very small because one of the square root of lambda one is very big. All right. So uh, obviously you can see in this direction, I am not very confident using the data. The likelihood model is not very confident in the estimation uh, of Ws in this direction. And because it's not very confident, you know what it will give you? Uh, it will pull basically your W estimate closer uh, to, this, um, to the contours of the prior which are centered around zero, and it will give you an estimate for W1 that is equal to zero. As a matter of fact, uh, I thought I added one equation here. You can, you know, if you write your likelihood as W minus WMLE transpose times the diagonals with lambda times W minus WMLE, and then you add your uh, prior model, which in the exponential of the Gaussian will be uh, alpha times uh, W transpose W, all right? You can immediately see that if you take derivatives with respect to W1, it will actually force, oh, here's the equation. This is what I wanted to do. So if you do the optimization problem for the map estimate in the direction uh, U1, this is what you will get, the W1 the map estimate is lambda 1 divided by lambda 1 plus alpha times the W1 MLE estimate. So if lambda 1 now is very small in this direction, this is very small, very small, then this answer comes equal to zero. So basically, the idea is the data, which is basically the MLE estimate, cannot give you a good estimate of W1 so they force W1 towards zero. This is the shrinkage model that you have seen in your homework on problem one. Same idea, all right? So again, the data cannot well estimate W1, all right, in this scenario because lambda one is very small, so they force W1 uh, to go to zero. So effectively what you have is you have uh, you can think of the map estimate as being a convex combination of the MLE estimate and the, uh, the estimates you get from your prior, but in this case are zero, okay? Because the prior is centered at zero. Now, if in the direction U2, lambda two is uh, much higher than lambda one, so effectively you can estimate W2 very well, all right? Uh, and and uh, away from the uh, map estimate, I'm sorry, away from the uh, zero that uh, that was uh, the center of the prior model. So the map estimate basically was well computed for W2, but not computed for uh, W1. So uh, what actually decides what you can estimate well and what you cannot estimate well is the ratio of the for each direction is of, for each eigen direction is the ratio of the eigenvalue in that direction divided by the eigenvalue plus alpha. Which means, what is the summation then of all these lambdas divided by lambdas plus alpha? So in the right direction, this tells you if you can actually estimate from your data uh, your w's well. So when I sum all of this, what is this whole parameter gamma gives me then? What's the physical meaning? I mean, think of in some areas, you know, in some directions, this is very small, it's zero, in some other directions is what it is. So when I sum up all of this, what do I get? I get the number of effective parameters that can be estimated from my given data set. 
Okay? So gamma is the number of effective parameters, and of course my effective parameters, since I have a polynomial of order m, is somewhere between 0 and m. Make sense? You know, talking to Matt, so I somehow, uh, when we're supposed to finish, remind me, I'm completely spaced out. For what? 45, wonderful. All right. It's late in the afternoon, come on. You know, I have the right also to, to be spaced out, no? Um, and lots of these things, right? I try to teach them every other day. Uh, they require that mentally you have to be spaced out, otherwise, uh, you cannot appreciate uh, sort of the complexity because a lot of the the conclusions really uh, come up with very sort of simple uh, uh, geometric uh, interpretation and this is a wonderful example actually that tells you this shrinkage effect why you know sometimes you have to pull towards the the mean of your prior simply because your data cannot tell you what uh, what to do all right and this is an example the mean of the prior is zero. So this gamma is the number of effective parameters, uh, and um, um, all right. And uh, so that's the end of the story. Okay. So uh, we already discussed the relation of these things with, uh, you know, with uh, the MLE estimate for the variance in, in the Gaussian case. So uh, all right. So uh, you you compute. Uh, you have to, you do these iterations. Uh, you find the optimal alpha, uh, you find the optimal uh, beta, and then you use a plug-in estimate and you compute the log of the marginal likelihood. And this is a plot that shows, for this case, the log of the marginal likelihood that you notice has a beautiful defined uh, maximum. Okay, so this uh, is uh, basically where you want to be, okay? This is where you want to be. Uh, this plot is gives it gives you this, you know. Uh, let me see what is that. Actually, um, this is for a given beta. You know, I mean, you should do this in two dimensions, actually, right? But you know, this is a given beta, and it gives you uh, how this marginal likelihood looks like with uh, alpha. So this is the point estimate, this alpha hat that you're going to have to use in uh, doing predictions. Okay, and interestingly enough. It comes out that when you plot the test error, when you compute the test error for different alphas, it comes out that at this location about where the test error starts growing, uh, that's where the proper alpha uh, also occurs. So a lot of the things you learn in um, standard uh, non-Bayesian ways, ways for training uh, this type of models it actually seemed to be in accordance with this idea of maximizing the marginal likelihood. Now, strongly encourage you, there's quotes there, but they were written by students, and I do hope by the end of the semester, this class writes some quotes that all the students next year and the years to come can use. Otherwise, you know, someone may ask me, uh, how come these quotes were written in 1963? All right, uh, so I need to have a justification for that. So I need some of your codes to update this. And if your code says, you know what, wrong, this is the right result, then that would be wonderful. Okay. All right. Um, don't want to have to do all of this. Uh, this are just a, another example. Okay. So. Um, Before we change topic, let me just say the following thing, right? The, the, I mean, we're going to come back to this model selection, obviously, because I want to tell you on uh, uh, this uh, sampling uh, methods for selecting basis functions. But one of the problems that we will need somehow to address in this class, right, is the fact that using fixed basis functions doesn't look to be very optimal. Because imagine that, uh, you know, you say I'm going to use polynomials, I'm going to use sigmoid functions, whatever, but those functions have never seen what data you have. So imagine that you have a lot of data here, a lot of x and y, and then you're going to use some global polynomials up there. What's the point? 
I mean, you're not going to be able to make any predictions here. You need to have basis functions where the data are. And, and obviously, you need to sort of have basis functions that they adapt to the data of your problem. It's not, I'm not suggesting that you look and you say, oh, I'm going to put basis functions there. No, somehow you need a framework that these basis functions automatically go and place themselves there rather than everywhere else. And uh, uh, so how are you going to do this, right? I mean, there are uh, multiple ways, and, and uh, uh, we will come back to it, hopefully, maybe in uh, uh, four lectures or so, to, to revisit this type of topic. All right, so uh, this is a repeat slide, actually. Okay. Uh, somewhere in the notes, okay, I have, um, let me just go back, uh, the same problem. I have uh, uh, a, a model selection for regression. Uh, this is a program uh, written in one of the tutorials that uh, some time ago I, uh, you know, I stole from uh, Zubin Karamani's uh, website. And uh, it's a MATLAB code, right? Like all of these codes, I think it's less than uh, 30 lines. So don't tell me the homework is lengthy, it's going to be painful. Please look at this program. It's 30 lines, and it does regression uh, in K dimensions, okay? Uh, with, uh, uh, you know, a prior, basically that is, uh, you know, an informative prior, similar to what we have discussed now, basically the same identical form. The only difference is that this matrix term is taken to be uh, an identity divided by this constant C. Okay? So, uh, otherwise the model looks identical to what we have done. Okay? So what he, he does is, he does um, maximization of this uh, uh, marginal accuracy to find the correct uh, model complexity. And I told you, if you want to find the marginal likelihood, uh, use the normalization factors of the likelihood, the prior and the posterior, all right? And don't do from scratch again and again the algebra the way you see it on this slide. So the calculations that you see here, you can actually get them in one line by taking these ratios of the normalizing factors of the likelihood prior and posterior. Okay, because that's the the marginal act which is basically the denominator in Bayes rule. So, anyways, uh, if you do the algebra properly, uh, and even better if you use directly these normalization factors, this is what uh, this uh, evidence looks like. All right, uh, somebody will say, "Wow, this is very complicated. How can we derive this in the homework in uh, in uh, one week? You know, this is awful. You know." There's a lot of gamma factors and um, um, uh, a lot of determinants I see here, you know, you know, and who knows, n over 2 minus alpha is like, how did this thing come from? Well, you know, just uh, look on the normalization factors and you will see, uh, I mean, obviously there was an inverse gamma there, right? The inverse gamma gives you a normalization factor that is something to a power, that's from where this thing has come from, okay, from the posterior distribution. If anybody doesn't believe me, the derivation of this equation is exactly one line. Ratio of normalization factors we already know. It's a, no calculations to be done. So there's any problem. Uh, it does regression in in uh, you know uh, with, uh, in k dimensions, and effectively with very few data points, it asks what is the right complexity of the model to explain the data. So uh, the program actually computes this uh, uh, for its model, the uh, marginal likelihood, and then you can immediately see that the quadratic polynomial is the one that best explains the evidence that we have, and that's the end of the, of the, of the story. Okay? So, uh, and again, I strongly encourage you to look at this, right? Because if you don't look at this, you may come in December and you tell me that you did as a project an evidence approximation for uh, approximating, I don't know, um, a Gaussian in two dimensions. Well, you know, he approximates this with a 30 lines code uh, for a regression problem. I don't remember how many dimensions, but this is not very difficult. And if you look at this program, you may get excited on what is out there, right? That you can do lots of very interesting things. Uh, for your own research and 
uh, for things to come in uh, your future careers. All right, 434. All right, uh, 434. So let me see. Um, let me let me just do this topic, and and we will come back on Friday, and uh, tell you about uh, uh, this uh, sampling approximations to do to model selection. So what I have on the on um, on the top is the regression function for our problem. So remember we have some functions p of x uh, times uh, w, and here what I do is I use a plug-in approximation. So I use the mean, uh, the predicted mean, if you like. Okay, so for W, I use the mean of the posterior of W, uh, and the mean of the posterior it, it is beta times this matrix S n times phi transpose t. Okay, we need to remember we drive the posterior, so the predicted mean basically for any x looks like this, all right, and. Um, I am expanding, so phi you remember phi the phi matrix in uh, every row it has the uh, basis functions computed at uh, a given input point. So every row corresponds to an input point. Uh, so when you expand this, basically you get summation over the data, all right? The basis functions times Tn, okay? Uh, just by expanding this phi transpose t, this is what you get. Now, why do I bother to put this predictive uh, uh, mean uh, to uh, this form? Uh, because uh, there is something there that maybe we may be able to explore, uh, and people, of course, in machine learning have explored enormously. So there are lots of things that we can discuss about this form. Notice that this form. Uh, it sounds this function of x, right? This thing is a function of x, but it sounds uh, each of these terms times the values of the, uh, of the y of the response of the data points. So basically, it says that the response at every x is an average, average defined with this term here, of your response to your data points, of your training data. So you may have already done this, right, in the context of other classes, but basically it tells you, you know what, you know all of these things are different x's. If you compute those, you can average them, and that will give you the response at every x. So that's one thing here. It tells you basically um, uh, don't get rid of Tn. If you want to make predictions, according to this formula, right, if you want to make predictions, uh, you can average all these Tn's. Now, you may say if I have a big data set, you know, keeping this TN may be not such a good idea, but here this is what you need to do. This term there, can you notice that it's a function of X and XN? XN is the, the input at the training point N. X is where I want to make predictions. This is what I call uh, a kernel. And I call a kernel this because this term here looks like the inner product of two functions. Can you imagine, you know what uh, inner product is, right? You have one function dotted with another function. Uh, these are vectors. So one function transpose times another function. Can you think of this as being a dot product between two vectors? And not in a unique way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be in a unique way, but this is really the dot product between two vectors. Okay? And I'm going to give you this in a forthcoming slide. So we'll call this kernel. And uh, then our prediction basically looks the following. If you want to make predictions at x, evaluate these kernels uh, over the data sets xn, and then multiply with the output in your training data, and that will give you the response y at a given x. Now, how do these kernels look like? This is very important. So uh, if you choose your basis functions to be Gaussians, radial basis functions, and you plot uh, this kernel for x versus xn, or here I call it x prime, 
he noticed that this curve that has very high values in the diagonal and far away from the diagonal is practically zero. So when I say, say here to do predictions at x, I average with this kernel my training data. What happens as uh, to the importance of a point n when I am away from x n, according to this picture? So if you try to account in the sum the the importance of uh, uh, the training t n to the predictions of the x, what happens when my point x where I want to make predictions is far away from xn, considering that this kernel is only significant in the diagonal? That particular point is not important. So effectively, these kernel functions, right, they are centered around your data sets tn, and as you go further from each data point, they basically die out and the, the, the importance, basically, of these kernels is local. It's like, you know, sort of putting a basis function on the top of its training point. And this method is actually, by the way, a very old machine learning approach, right? So if you want to do interpolation and you're given a lot of TN at different extent points, you know what you do is go and put a Gaussian on the top of each of these training points and then basically average uh, the product of these uh, Gaussians, right, uh, with the training data PN. But here, this average is happening with these uh, kernels. Now, why do we care about kernels? I mean, we, we know already, you know, this should give the same results as these basis functions phi of x, okay? Uh, why do we care? And uh, so, uh, let me see if I have written somewhere the explicit form of these kernels. Give me one second. Uh, so in, in this particular, well, where, do you see any kernel function? Yes, here it is, okay? So basically, this is in our problem, all right? The equation that this is how we define the kernel. This was the z was our x endpoint, right? I define it between two locations, x and z. So maybe I define the kernel again, in a non-unique way, as the inner product between psi transpose psi, uh, where psi is given by this, uh, uh, this vector. Okay? So here is the big deal about kernel methods. If this idea using kernels works, and from basis functions I can go uh, to an equivalent representation in terms of kernels, how about if I start with an arbitrary kernel, get rid of the concept of, of basis functions, and directly use this type of approximation. And, and uh, so you basically have no kernels at all to bother about, what, you know, and you only use, I'm sorry, you have no basis functions to bother, and you start directly with kernels. So when you do that, you lead to a whole new area of machine learning in uh, kernel methods. And uh, why is that important? because the type of kernels that you can define are practically infinite. You can define uh, infinite, and it's actually a whole area in machine learning where maybe there is an optimal kernel that you need to design to capture the variabilities you have in different directions, you know, so you can do uh, what is called kernel design. Uh, so if we have time, and I hope we do, we spend at least one uh, lecture to discuss about kernel methods, right? But the spirit is get rid of basis functions completely and use this idea here. And rather than introducing kernels through these functions phi, start directly with a kernel defined between two points x and x prime, and then take this kernel, evaluate it at x and xn for each of the data points, and then do predictions using that. That will give you kernel methods. And of course, uh, you can push this to fully non-parametric methods. And uh, this, uh, as we will see, uh, can make sense in the context of uh, Gaussian processes uh, and the like. So interestingly enough, all right, and I will finish with that for today, uh, the basis functions that we use, let's say maybe they were polynomials of global support. So they vary everywhere, OK? But when you compute even with polynomials, these kernels, they are always picked at a certain location. So 
So the chemists have always local support. So remember what I was saying is that you need the basis functions to adapt to the data. Well, these kernels do adapt to the data. Why? Because they only pick where the data are. And we don't force them to do that. It just happened when we evaluate k at x and x uh, n. This is really significant when x is close to xn. So basically, you have your kernels, your basis functions to adapt to your data in an automatic way uh, by starting directly with these kernels. So again, the basis functions don't have to be localized. Right? That's the problem with uh, basis functions methodologies. But the kernels, they're always picked. right? So in our case, they're picked around uh, the data points. Uh, one minute I'm going to tell you. So there's a homework that I'm going to post tonight. And I'm going to tell you the exciting thing that uh, uh, you guys will have to do. And the exciting thing is the following. I am going to remove the slides, actually, from the lecture today. But I wanted to tell you what. Um, um, so um, let me just uh, you know, we have less than one second, OK? Uh, we follow lots of basis functions. And uh, what we will do is we will introduce uh, a hidden variable that is going to be 1 or 0 that will tell me if that basis function should be in the model or not. OK? So we will enhance. Not only will we have the Ws, but also we will have these hidden variables that say, should I keep this base function or not? Then what we're going to do is on these hidden variables, we're going to put some prior model. And we're going to produce a posterior of this hidden variable. OK? And then, by somehow sampling from that posterior, we're going to be able, rather than exploring by hand or with the computer, let's say for k basis functions, we have to explore 2 to the k models, because each model is either there or it's not. So rather than having, much of case 100, this is huge. So rather than having to compute all of these models and select the right model, we're actually going to sample uh, over the space of the possible